if you trust the legal process, then you should be willing to accept this ruling from the Colorado Supreme Court as well as accept the ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court should they overturn it. And I think I see a lot of that from our side. Like the pro-democracy forces today are basically like, yes, well, this is the legal process playing out. And the anti-anti-Trumpers are like, this is absolutely illegitimate. And blah, blah, blah. But if they get the, the verdict they want from, from the federal Supreme Court, then it's going to be like, great, yes, this is, this is the real legal process. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Next Level. I'm JVL here with my best friends, Sarah Longwell and Tim Miller of The Bulwark. It is Christmas week, or the week before Christmas, Christmas week eve, maybe, I don't know, and we just got a uh, a little something that might be a present or might be a lump of coal from the state Supreme Court in Colorado, Colorado, I don't know, Tim, Colorado. You, you are Colorado's own. Color- uh, Colorado. You're going to really kick this off by showing that you can't pronounce Colorado? No, it's, it's true that um, in in rural Colorado there is a, a, a faction that pronounces it Colorado, Thank you. Thank and it's you. a little bit it's a little bit it used to be conservative coded, and then all the mm. everybody moved in from you know Missouri and Texas and California, and that kind of that went away. That's the joke. Maybe we should just start the whole show over again since no, I killed good. the joke. It's good for yeah. people to know. A little so fun we're... fact: Colorado. Do you want any more Colorado fun facts? Hold, save them. We're okay. going to get there. Uh, Yesterday, seven Democratic-appointed Supreme Court justices ruled three in dissent, four in the majority, that due to the 14th Amendment, Donald Trump cannot appear on the presidential ballot this year in the Sunshine State of Denver. Uh, Take that, Trump. I would like to hear your thoughts. I went and wrote a very svelte 2,500 words about this last night, which is currently burning up the Internet. Uh, but I do not know. I know a little bit about what you think, Tim. Well, but I want to start with Sarah because I have no well, not idea all of our listeners, is. Not all of our listeners have, have read your triad. Um, Sarah well, maybe they did should. in the green room. But I, I, I skimmed it they, just now. Maybe why don't you summarize your argument and so then Please. Sarah can give, the, give, a, give her well, account. Because I, I suspect that she disagrees with you. So I'd like to, I'd like to maybe hear you. I don't have an argument. Yeah, he doesn't what, make an argument. It's my, a, did you read my this argument thing? Is, is it's kind of an argument. I can see all of the sides of this both ways. Uh, we have we have three issues essentially. We have a legal question, a political question, and then a deep philosophical question about what the law is for. And on all three of those, I can see both sides of this. Uh, and and so that's you know I I can but you see make a, a you, you make a quasi argument at least that the Republicans who are complaining about this and who are saying that oh norms are being attacked et cetera et cetera are a bunch of crybabies and that maybe. Even though you can see both sides, Donald Trump should not get to subvert the law at his will. And then anytime he's tried to help, people try to hold him accountable for the law, then they get to cry foul. You did make that argument. That was a, that was a pretty yeah. clear case yeah. that you made. I well, and, th- and that, is a, that is a pure case of, about why the people, who are, the people who are most vehemently objecting to this are, are very, very bad people. They are, I mean— I mean, just to put this broadly, our, our our friend of the show, Keith Edwards, uh, threaded out, tweeted out earlier today that it's the same people who in 2020 wanted to overturn the will of the voters who are now saying that you have to let the will of the voters be expressed. You can't <laughs> like it's it's insane. Um, but but as I said, I'm just sort of both sides in it. And uh, mm-hmm. I would like to hear where Sarah is. Well, can I just so the, I think we we suffer uh, or perhaps are helped by the fact that nobody on this podcast is an attorney. Um, and so I would say that one of the things that I don't know is the legal question. Right. So so I would say the decent the most decent faith argument I've seen from our uh, friends on the anti anti side is that Trump has not been convicted yet of an insurrection. And so for them mm. to rule that he is off the ballot because he caused an insurrection without him being convicted of causing an insurrection. I I find that, I don't know enough about the law, but that makes like intuitive sense to me. I am a question. uh, Can I just weigh in on this? One one minute, one minute, Timothy. I do seem to have read very recently from one of our anti-anti friends, National Review's own Andy McCarthy, that prosecuting Trump for criminal offenses 
is a terrible norm shattering idea which shouldn't be done mm. so there is a little bit of a hey you can't do this because he hasn't been convicted of any criminal offenses you can't possibly try him for criminal offenses <laughs> yeah it does I mean, seem circular it does although i mean i guess we could spend our time arguing with the bad faith of the anti-anti crowd and god knows my i i that sounds good I, yeah, I know. That's all of them, though. I, I know. I know, I know, I know. But but I guess I'm trying, what I'm trying to do is take the arguments objectively on their merits and figure out exactly how I feel about it. Tim, go ahead, Tim. I'm sick. Uh, well, JVL cut, cut me off. I was going to answer that question for you. I'm sick and I'm a bachelor this week. So I had nothing to do last night. So I listened to several hours of Lawfare and our friend David French. So I'm going to play a lawyer on this podcast right now. And if you want actual lawyers, mm. you can go over to Lawfare. But, um, you know, the, the, the people that wrote the initial brief about this, like, offered a definition of insurrection, right? Which, was, which I don't have in front of me, but, but is pretty plainly what Donald Trump did. And I think that when I was listening to French in particular, I thought French made a compelling point, which was like, look at Jefferson Davis. Like, when the 14th Amendment was written to prevent people that attempted insurrection from holding office, had Jefferson Davis come back in eight years and tried to run for president and had popular support in certain states, I, it, I mean, I guess it would have been controversial among among the, the uh, 19th century cletuses, but, like, it would not have been constitutional among legal minds that he could not run because literally that was what they made the 14th, um, you know, that, that is what the third whatever of the 14th Amendment is for, right? So, okay, I, I and you know I, I so I I think that like on the merits there's a very defensible argument and I think that it is worth making the making the case that to, to JVL's point about Andy McCarthy I want to take it one step further I, I I don't think this is just talking about bad faith I think it's important to just walk through what happened like they had a chance to convict him for this right. crime right and then they chose not to do it several people. Mitch McConnell included on the Senate floor said that they could not vote for conviction because he wasn't president anymore. And because he wasn't president anymore, then the courts needed to take care of this. Right. Yeah. And then then when the courts start to take care of it, it's like, oh, these politicized prosecutors are going after him. And Boy, it'd be much when, better just let the voters take care of it. And yeah, if the voters the judges... take care of it again, then we're going to have to go back to the courts because, you know... <laughs> Right. So I have I have political concerns that we can talk about all those, but I just, you know, and and I don't, and obviously it's not legally cut and dry based on the fact that a seven, you know, a seven member court all appointed yeah. by Democrats went four to three, right? and, like, and also because as you note, he was not convicted by uh, like, right? Like you have not seen him be convicted anywhere, and and it, they didn't impeach him for it. Yeah. If they'd and impeached state, him for it, there's a there's a technical know. state law thing too, which is what the most of the dissent seems to have been about. Which is a, again, is is more of a technical application of can the Colorado state law on this stuff supersede the Constitution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, but I so I think we can all just basically agree that from a legal perspective, both sides can make a case, right? And that you could make this into a a judgment call right this is a legal judgment call it is not like one side is saying the moon is green cheese and the other side is saying it's it's regular right? yeah and i guess I, i'm saying that i don't have a strong opinion on the legal side until i've i don't know I, i'd have to do what tim did and listen i tried to go read a few things the opinion that they did is extremely long so i couldn't read that um and here's the then so but staying on the legal case just for one minute because tim i would put this to you then so what about the fact that the supreme court is likely to overturn the state fine the state you know outcome yeah. i mean are we sure i don't know the supreme court the supreme court has surprised us a couple times recently i mean they uh they weighed in on the side of the um you know the civil rights case in alabama where they said that the, the alabama redistricting was wrong and they needed two majority minority districts because of the uh, because of the Voting Rights Act and a 6-3 Trumpy court um, sided with uh, al sided with the, the people suing Alabama on that one. So I, I will see. I, probably, yeah, probably the Supreme Court is not going to side with them since, uh, again, a seven-person Democratic court went 4-3. But, I mean, again, I just, I think that if your argument is, it, this is gray, it's a Civil War era amendment, and, like, it doesn't explicitly even say the word president in the amendment. You know, I, if your argument is that this is gray, okay, that's fine. But, again, I, I guess I just – I was most compelled by, by David French going to keep shouting out his argument that, 
Like Jefferson Davis wasn't convicted of anything. Like they did what JVL has been suggesting Biden do about Trump. Like they they ended up uh, decided not to prosecute him. Um, and, you know, in the spirit of, you know, trying to bring the country back together or whatever. But then after they didn't prosecute him, had he come back in 1872 or whatever and said I was running for president, like, I think it would have been unobjectionable that he was barred from it. So then the question is, well, is the South uprising against the North, like, is that different in nature in some way than Donald Trump's insurrection? Like, I, you know, now we get, you know, into, into uh, we'll have a lot of constitutional law, law experts writing briefs about this. Yeah. Okay. So let's get onto the terrain that I feel good on because I don't. I, I don't know. I don't have strong opinions on the legal side. Can I, can I just put a bow yeah. on this one second before you move yeah. on, Sarah? So I think what what we are saying is, if you trust the legal process, then you should be willing to accept this ruling from the Colorado Supreme Court, as well as accept the ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court should they overturn it. Right. And I Which, think I see yeah. a lot of that from our side, like the pro-democracy forces today are basically like, yes, well, this is the legal process playing out. And the anti-anti-Trumpers are like, this is absolutely illegitimate. And blah, blah, blah. But if they get the, the verdict they want from from the federal Supreme Court, then it's going to be like, great. Yes, this is yeah, this is Rubio the real is like process. we're going to sanction we would sanction other countries that did this. And it's like no, this is this is this is not the deep state. Like this is not some autocracy. It's it's one judge in one court. Like we have a legal system. Now they get to appeal. Like this is not banana republic shit. No. Okay, so All can right. I just here's my ultimate Politics. take then, uh, which is that the rule of law arguments which I would make and the political argument that I would make are in fundamental tension, right? They're, they're, they're in fundamental tension, and that this is what I struggle with about this, which is I believe that we should follow the law and do what's right, sort of the outcome be damned a little bit, right? Like, let right be done, okay? Uh, and I think that legal part is a struggle because it's like, well, what exactly is right? Like, okay, and, and I agree with JVL. Like, I accept what Colorado ruled, and I will accept what the Supreme Court rules, and I can sort of see the arguments on either side of it. On the political side, and going back to the conversation about healing a nation, right, the soul of a nation, I just feel like it is so much better for America to, if I think if, if Trump is disqualified by the courts, I think where that leaves us as a country is in a very bad place, Whereas I think if we beat Trump in 2024, it leaves the country in a much better place. Um, and that I don't want to beat him. This is just my personal opinion is I don't want to beat him in the courts. I want to. And people will say, but he might win. And I'm not sure that that. That like he might it's win. Huh? I know he might win. <laughs> I know he might win. But I also think that it says something about who we are deeply if after what Trump did, the American people can look at it and say yes. And I think it's on us and on every, Biden and everybody else to make sure Americans don't make that choice, to persuade them not to do it. Uh, and I don't think that I just I think it's like bad for the soul of the country. OK, um, I, I take that argument and I basically agree with it, but I want to make the counter argument. For starters, yeah, sure. if I'm ranking the outcomes that we have in front of us, you know, this is going to be just for YouTube viewers here so you can see my hand. Way up here at the top is we beat Donald Trump at the ballot box next year. Yeah. Handily. Like down here towards the middle bottom <laughs> is, is us disqualifying him because he was disqualified because he attempted an insurrection. Way down here underneath the earth is Donald Trump becoming the president again after he tried to... Uh, uh, you know, overturn the results of an election after we had our first non-peaceful transfer of power since the Civil War. So, like, I, again, I agree with you. It's not the ideal outcome, but if the if the rulings are such and the Fourteenth Amendment is clear enough, and, and a Republican Supreme Court says so, I, okay, I'm to, I'm kind of down to clown on that. And I also will just say, I like I I refuse to. I know that this is like going into your bad faith argument or whatever, but I I just it, it bears saying. The, the, the only reason that we have Donald Trump at all and that we're dealing with this at all is because he got famous trying to disqualify the first black president from being able to run. From being, but from birther, because he's a birther, because he's a racist birther. 
Like, that's the only reason we are even here at all. Like, had Donald Trump not glommed on to birtherism, you know, Ted Cruz probably would have been the nominee last in 2016, and we're on a, a totally Earth 2, and, and I, you know, who the hell knows what would happen then. I'm sure we'd have other problems. But, um, but like, I, I just, I refuse to be lectured to, okay, about this, about, about abiding by what a single Supreme Court says from people that are running cover from somebody whose entire political identity is based on a racist attempt to disqualify the first black president from office based on a lie. Okay, yeah. Barack Obama was born in Hawaii. Donald Trump did try an insurrection. So like, as far as I, if I'm like ranking, which is more afoul of our norms, I would say that the Donald Trump behavior is much more afoul. So I, sure. I, I understand everything that you're saying, sir. I just, I'm making, I, I feel like that needs to be said. Yeah. I want to put a point on what you what you said, Sarah, about the, the fundamental tension here, because the tension, this is why, like, I've been banging this drum since, like, October of 2020, when I started saying Trump is going to be the, Trump is going to lose this time, and he's going to be the nominee next time. We are heading to a place where we get a crisis either way. Yeah, that's right. Because if that's the right. rule of law chooses to not attempt to hold Trump accountable because it thinks that the political outcome of that is to make Trump's election more likely, then that itself creates a crisis because, yes. well, now this guy has the ability to break the law with impunity, and anybody who comes after this has no downside for attempting an insurrection of their own, right? And this is, and but yet you, you know, like, I don't know. the The polling is pretty clear. After Trump gets indicted for the first time, his numbers in the Republican poll shoot up, right? So, so maybe that did help him. Yeah, in fact, it, it clearly did help him. Now, maybe he would have won even without that help. I don't know. But this is a, you know, Certainly. we have two doors in front of us, and behind one of them is a tiger, and behind the other one is an alligator. And it's really, it's not great. And the, the reason we're in I front of these doors— I think I could take doors, an alligator. The reason we're in front of these doors is because Republican elites like Paul Ryan, until till last week where he yeah. said the right thing, but a whole bunch of Republican elites all the way, every time they were offered an opportunity to hold Trump accountable, when the system was trying to hold Trump accountable, they short-circuited it. And they yeah. prevented accountability from happening because they assumed somebody else would take care of the problem for them and so they wouldn't have to incur any political pain. They wanted all the power and all the political advantage without having to endure any pain. And that that's why we're in this place. 100%. It's not the fault of, of Democrats. It's not the fault of the courts. It's not the fault of uh, anybody else, really. It really is the institutional Republican Party. Yeah, and, and, and the, you're right about how it—, it and, uh, I'm getting like jumped out on Twitter for saying I think we need to beat Trump uh, at the ballot box and not in the courts. Um, this is totally the fault uh, of the Republican elites. That doesn't change the fact that like I'm going to struggle this whole time with the fact that we are boxed into this place. So like here's another example. I'm just going to warn you guys now that as we get into as we get as Trump's the nominee. And we are down because everybody who's arguing that somehow these court cases are going to happen in the primary timeline, I just think they're wrong. I don't think we're going to get a conviction on Trump. But we may get convictions on him during the election. And even there, like, I'm going to start to get really nervous about the idea of prosecuting the nominee for the Republican for, for president. Like, he is chosen by his party. And I under, like, I, you can argue the politics of it. You can argue the accountability of it. You are shattering norms either way. Yes. You are shattering them either way. You are either, either one presents a constitutional crisis. And that's why it is very difficult for me to come down hard on one of these sides because I just will feel sort of sick to my stomach at the idea of a, a, a the presidential nominee, like, getting prosecuted in the middle of the you election. You don't want to hear this, but there is only one way out of this that preserves all of the norms. It's the pardon. It's Biden just coming out and saying, you know what? We got to put all this behind us. We got to pardon him. This is literally what the, as Alexander Hamilton But at what wrote, point does you he pardon, pardon him? him? Before the election? Before the election? <sighs> Maybe he has to. 
look, I mean, it, I'm just talking out loud here. I'm not wedded <laughs> to this idea. But I am saying that one way, you, know, you may decide that the pardon itself becomes worse than the cure, right? The, 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 the cure is worse than the disease. And I'm, I'm open to that possibility. But one way to preserve both, the law has to hold people who try these things accountable and we don't want to be in a place where we're prosecuting uh, a, a criminal prosecution of a candidate from a major party in the middle of the election. The one way to hold both of those norms up is for Biden to pardon him. We can think about maybe some some other solutions or, or around. We can keep thinking. I, we can I, keep I brainstorming. Not, I one in mind that I'm not going to say on the podcast, but I've been thinking about one. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't. I get it. I. I, I I also get how so so the pardon I guess I think is a ridiculous suggestion he's never going to do it but um but like it, it speaks to this I understand your low your basic low information voter like looks at this and is like oh you're for democracy you know like we're going to ban it for that it seems preposterous or high information anti antis yeah also right makes like, like, that argument like, right like everybody like it seems preposterous you know yeah. it does because like really what we're saying right now and this is the favorite Sarah line is like we're we're we want to protect liberal democracy, right? Mm -hmm. Like we want, which which is encompassing of, you know, the rule of law and 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 uh, the other elements, right? So, I, I just, I, I don't think that there's a good answer to it. I mean, look, here's here's the truth: if every person who is part of the institutional version of the Republican Party, the Ron DeSantis, the Nikki Haley's, the Rona McDaniel's, the the Senate Republicans, Mitch McConnell. If they all came out today and just said, we can't have this guy as a nominee. This is a serious case, and I'm not going to prejudge it. We're going to see what the Supreme Court says, but this is – and this one hammer and tongs at Trump. Then they might blow up the Republican Party for a cycle, but they would prevent Trump from becoming president. Yeah. And I know it's West Wing fantasy politics to expect Nikki well, Haley to do something <laughs> that would help her, her chances of becoming president, but – did you see Vivek uh, Ramaswamy came out and he said he is he is withdrawing from the the slate in Colorado and demanding he is demanding that Nikki Haley and Chris Christie and Ron DeSantis do the same. Uh, and I, I got to tell you, if we get into just like rank politics for a second, uh, one of the things that is just like obviously um, I have been analytically I am with everybody who says Nikki Haley can't do it spiritually i've been like rooting for her and looking for this you know my mind goes to all these places about like how could how could it work you know and i i argued with wit about this on the focus group podcast um but i still find myself really rooting for her, her moment is over now like yep. the conversation about it, it it's over unless she seizes on it in some way uh it's self-interest right? and 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 the chances that they all spend their time now just as they've done previous I, I maybe they could prove me wrong but if i had to guess i would say they all spend their time saber rattling along with vivek about how yeah. terrible this is and ultimately just helps trump and robs nikki of while also the little momentum she's had that the supreme court upholds oh, the yeah, totally, totally. that's the other the, the yeah, other yeah, yeah. the other turn of this is that they will publicly talk about how good while you know being on their knees with their rosary beads every night mm. praying that gorsuch uh and roberts decide to uphold the Colorado yeah. Supreme Court. and this is the problem with all this just my last point on this is these are like we're in the hands of the worst people right like everybody mm -hmm. like there is no good option for the <laughs> pro-democracy side of this as we've been hanging out like there is a clear option for nikki haley like nikki haley going guns blazing at donald trump and saying we cannot support somebody that backed an insurrection we can't have that in our party and if we do i'm going to support joe biden like obviously she's not going to do that but like our fate is in the hands of the worst people had 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 20 of the worst enablers all just united and said no to this or had 10 more senators you know then we wouldn't be here um, but we are, and they're not going to do the right thing. And that leaves us, they're the reason why we're left in this situation. Well, the good news is they're doing it for a guy who's not trying to make it harder for them. Uh, <laughs> we have after the week after, I think Vermin was last week, maybe mm -hmm. it was two weeks ago, that Donald Trump called uh, his opponents Democrats and, and liberals Vermin. 
and now his warning about... Steve Bannon updated that. I called Robert Kagan vermin at TPUSA mm. in order to do TPUC later. But that was very subtle, I thought. A very subtle. So uh, now Trump is saying that uh, immigrants are poisoning the blood of America. And when asked, boy, that sounds like something from Hitler's Mein Kampf, instead of saying, uh, no, that's ridiculous... He said, well, I've never read Mein Kampf, which is like this is it's literally what he did when he was asked, like, disavow the Proud Boys or disavow David Duke. Right. His his response is not, of course, I disavow David Duke. It's like, well, I don't know anything about David Duke. Never met the guy. No, don't, don't know anything about him. <laughs> uh, someone on our is... Reddit was mad because me and Bill talked about this briefly last night on YouTube, and it was like, "Well, it, well, there was that story about how he had Hitler's speeches by his bed," and it's kind of like, I, "Okay, okay, I, I don't know whether he's lying about this or not." If you're just looking at me, I'm going to always err on the side of Donald Trump not reading, not reading you know, a book, like having, say. not reading a book, having the speeches, you know, to kind of to wave around at people and trigger them. Like that feels like Donald Trump reading something from a different era uh, is a no for me. Yeah. But so I, I agree with him. He probably has not read Mein Kampf, um, which he really act, which he really spoke with a very German accent. He, he, <laughs> he, was, he was like Mein Kampf. No, this like, is how this is how this works, guys. Donald Trump's never he reads no books. He didn't write his own book. He doesn't read his own book. You know who read Mein Kampf? I'm quite certain. Stephen, Stephen Miller, Miller. <laughs> ding, who, ding, ding. who routinely probably just says to Trump over Coca-Cola's uh, or diet Coca-Cola's okay. or whatever he drinks, uh, these immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country. And it's just the kind of thing then that Trump uh, says out loud. He didn't read anything about it. He has the worst people in his ears all the time giving him these lines that now come to him naturally. Yeah, but then and once again, the, this... they're, they're big applause lines. Yeah. Oh, yeah, huge applause. Right? And in the same thing that we just went through for seven years, because we, we hit, like, fucking time is a flat circle, it's like he does it the first time, and then J.D. Vance at all is like, well, I, I think he's talking about fentanyl, obviously. You know, he's talking about fentanyl and how, how that's poisoning our blood. And then, like, Trump goes back up there and does a speech last night where he's like, I... No, he's like, people are mad at me. They're saying I'm Hitler for saying poison the blood. But no, he's like, I mean it. He's like, they're poisoning the blood. They're bringing in diseases. <laughs> like, what they're doing is poisoning our people. And it's like, I'm not talking about fentanyl. I'm talking about they're literally poisoning our blood. Like, Do you guys okay. know what's so weird? Like, you just forget. He is married to an immigrant that he had a child with. Yeah. Who is the Blind product of... Huh? A blonde child. Okay, but still, I'm sorry that Trump's de- genes are so dominant. Very the evil tall, genes. blonde child. Uh, but I'm, it's just uh, like whatever. This guy, he's just the he's worst. Not he's not talking just about that. European immigrants, Sarah. <laughs> uh, yeah, not the ones who become models. Yeah, no. just the ones fleeing gang violence uh, from Mexico. Which, look, whatever. I'm not going to get into an immigration thing, but. Uh, He's a terrible person, and we should be able to beat him. Well, we should be able to beat him if the American people are serious people. Wait, Tim, have you talked about the TPUSA thing much? We're going to get you... to it. Oh, we're going to get to it. We're going to get to it. We're going to get to it after this message from a sponsor. This episode Good is tease. sponsored by Hello Fresh. After a full day of work, there's still so much to do. My God, is there. Uh, some days it feels like eating a wholesome dinner is next to impossible. I call those days the ones that end in why but with hello fresh you can turn busy weeknights into memorable meal times with delicious practical options designed to save you time like their 15 minute meals and you know hello fresh does more than just dinners from easy breakfasts to start your morning off right to 10 minute lunches or satisfying snacks both adults and kids will love hello fresh has tasty choices for every mealtime occasion and the best part no grocery trip required uh, they sent us some HelloFresh stuff, and I, it was just legit great. It was legit great. It was high-quality ingredients. The stuff was actually, like, there was a lot of produce. It was really good produce, and uh, it tasted good, and it was actually pretty easy to prepare. I don't like cooking. I think cooking how, is what, horrible. How much, what, how much cooking are you doing in the home, JVL? Uh, I mean, my wife does, to the extent that we do cooking, my wife does most of it. I, I do cooking that involves pizzas or breakfast for dinners. 
mm. which is you know some high percentage of of dinner time meals. Mm. Um, real cooking, my wife does it. Both of us hate it. Like we don't enjoy it. We're not cooking people. Mm. Um, but the HelloFresh stuff. It's is, a good like, thing you're not cooking easy. people. That would be so te- so bad. It would be. It would be. And HelloFresh does not does not endorse that. Um, but no, like we're not cooking people, and this was fine to cook. <laughs> like and and it tasted good afterwards. The recipes were simple and easy to easy to put together. Do you know how much cooking I do in the home? Zero. Zero point zero, and yeah. everybody's grateful. Yeah. I cook. So, uh, Who would have thought? Yeah. yeah. I don't, yeah. Know, if the, I don't no, know if people surprised. would have graded me as the most likely cook on this podcast, but I am. A hundred percent they would have. You think so? Because yeah. of my game? Of course of they would gay stuff? Is you are gay? wearing a pink beanie. You're, no, because you're a bon vivant. That's why. I am a bon vivant. Go to HelloFresh.com slash the next level free and use code the next level free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while your subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash the next level free with code the next level free. We'll get to, to TPUSA in a second. New York Times has a poll which shows oh, Biden ahead of Trump <laughs> among Likely voters among all voters, including people who didn't vote in 2020, uh, he's losing to Trump. I mean, it's hard for me to think that the people who didn't turn out for the highest turnout election in American history, where we had like the easiest possible voting because of all the pandemic protocols put in, that those people are going to turn out in big numbers this time, that's hard for me to imagine. Maybe it will. Maybe it will turn out that way. Uh, so I saw this Times poll as encouraging news for Biden. Um, thoughts? Same. I feel like I was on a, I need the shirt maybe for 2024 because that was like a big week for Tim being always right. Just like the never back down, super pack, totally collapsing and crashing and burning and oh, being yeah. completely worthless well, have we after even talked I had about that. About that? No, let's do that. that. Let's do that uh, on top of TPUSA. Okay, okay, we'll add that after. So I had that, you know, that I've been writing about for a while, about how worthless that super PAC is, how they're burning their money on fire. Somebody, I saw there was a puck story about how some new donors pen- putting $10 million into Nikki Haley, and I was like, why won't one of these people call me? I want to save you money, rich people. I want to save you money. Okay, anyway, this poll on the Tim is always right. The, the flip, I don't think that it's really, it is not sunk in with our democracy um, friends, our pro-democracy friends in the nonprofit activism space, some of whom will listen to this podcast. So I'm just trying to help it sink in that we have had a switch in the electorate in addition to the red dog switch for the working class voters. As part of that switch, we now have a situation where the, the least likely to turn out people are hostile to Democrats and the most likely to turn out people are the core of the democratic base this was not true when i was growing up early in politics you know and so for a while like that's part of the reason why the like well part of the reason that why republicans have a reputation for voter suppression is because they've tried voter suppression a lot particularly in the cities but another reason is just that there was a general sense in republican campaigns it was kind of unspoken like we wanted turnout to be down you know more people was bad right that's not true that's not true in 2024 we kind of want turnout to be down and and I thought that the Joe Biden number of of being better this I thought this was the most encouraging thing among 2020 voters the result was better than 2020 he had gained two points um, again there's margin of error so that's that's kind of noisy but still um, I thought that's telling and I think that a lot of these polls um, right now that are using a registered voter screen. Are, are causing a little bit of unnecessary panic. So I'm not, I'm not sanguine. I'm not like, oh, this is not a what's the guy hopium substack. God love you. Um, I mean, it's, it's, but it's just I was encouraged by that because I concur with you, JVL, that I think that like looking at that likely voter screen in the biggest turnout election in history, that's that's a good sign for Biden. And and I think that like the polling right now, uh, again, saying something that <clears throat> people may not love, but. The, the numbers with young people, like, it feels like a temper tantrum. Which like is. we're in the middle of a temper tantrum that people are having over Joe Biden being the nominee, Joe Biden's mm-hmm. position on Israel, and like have your temper tantrum. But people who are 
Uh, so one of the things, uh, my team's been looking at a bunch of the numbers from 2020 as we think about uh, our 2024 campaigns. And there's a bunch of interesting stuff, you know, where actually white voters over 65, who you think of as being pretty Trumpy, are actually the ones who have been moving more in Joe Biden's direction. Yep. Now, why is that? Because a lot of those over 65 voters are people who remember Reagan's Republican Party and do not identify with Trump's Republican Party. And so yeah, there they is remember move- fascism. That's right. That's right. They remember when when uh, Russia was our enemy. Yeah. <laughs> and so so those people are actually moving. And I think that uh, and those people vote absolutely reliably. Uh, whereas a lot of these young voters who are pro- who are having temper tantrums are not the most reliable voters. Uh, and so, you know, I don't I don't think we have to, like, get too high on the hopium one way or the other or even interpret the two percentage points. I do think like it's the reason that Democrats have been winning these off year elections. Right. Yeah. Is because yeah. these voters are reliable in off year elections. And so. I just I, that it is worth keeping this in mind that the Democrats have traded up in some regard uh, by getting more reliable voters out of these kind of like bread dog types. And that's good for them. Did you did you see I thought the most fascinating for you about do you have a take on this? Because I want to I want to actually pull up this number. Um, go, go, okay, go here ahead. it is. Here it is. The most fascinating outtake from this New York Times poll. I, Nate Cohn is good at asking like nerd questions deep down that that like scratch my nerd itch. Um, so he asked people uh, for their vote uh, who voted. Did you vote in the 2014 election? Now, obviously, there's going to be some self-identifying issues here, but it's it's still the trend is kind of interesting among the people that said that they voted in 2015. The party registration was R plus five, but the 2024 vote was Biden plus 10. Like that is, that is your red dogs. Like that is a 15 point switch of people that voted Republican, that were Republicans in 2014 that have Biden in 20, in 24. Now on the flip side, didn't vote in 2014. These are the unreliable voters we're talking about. D plus 10 in their party registration, Trump plus eight in their expected vote for next time these are your union guys that never voted lifestyle before. And, yeah um, lifestyle voters your lifestyle <laughs> voters i mean that i just thought that was like if you wanted just a one stat that was like realignment in one stat um i i, I thought it was very kind of telling and and that folks are like still a little like they understand that the realignment is happening but like the degree to which it's happened you know at 18 point and 15 point swing I think it hasn't sunk in for a lot of folks. And this is and this is where it's easy to think, well, look, there's a lot more white working class voters who vote on like the gays are getting married and I don't like it. And the college educated suburban voters are a smaller percentage. But and so you're like, oh, it feels like, you know, Dems are losing on that trade. But the reason that it's a good trade and they're trading up is that those voters are more reliable uh, who will show up. And those people who only really get motivated by like. Uh, the the invasion, (laughs) yeah, right, whatever, Uh, you know. But here's the, but but then on the down, on the downside is that this is where when Trump is actually on the ballot, you just worry about the turnout equation because they show up for Trump. Like it is, and and the question of um, persuasion and pushing this realignment and focusing for persuasion on, uh, you know, a lot of these sort of white suburban voters, that's, that's important. Um, but it's going to come down to turnout uh, and how much tr- people are motivated by Trump. And I, what do you guys make of the youth numbers? So not just the part that we've been talking about in terms of the sort of temper tantrum progressives being mad at Biden, but the actual fact that Trump is doing much better with young people. And I think there's a number of people who've tried to – who've explained, and we've talked about this before because it came through loud and clear and we've been doing the focus groups with the young people, which is Trump is the only – like for the last 10 years he's been so – the dominant politician that they don't see him as a political aberration the way that we do like out so, so outside yeah. the norms and mainstream um and so you can see why he might actually and also speaking of bad trades like republicans got all the these like barstool sports young guys too yeah. um let me but what did you make you of guys that? for let me ask you guys to clarify something for me that i don't fully understand so trump does better among 
young Republicans than he does older Republicans. This is we saw this in the primary. Right? DeSantis's edge was in old, old Republicans uh, early in the primary when he was doing well, and Trump's big support was like the youth. The, the youths liked him. Yeah. Um, that is true intra Republican party, but when you zoom all the way out and just look at the youth vote as a whole. Like under 30 voters are trending more Democratic than they had been previously. Correct. It's just that Repu Republicans under 30 are more Trumpy. But as a whole, that's share of the pie. Like people who are under 30 who identify as Republicans is shrinking. Correct. Or do I have that wrong? Um, you well, you had it right up until 2020. I mean, like we'll see in 2024 if that's true. Um, but that was true up till 2020. And then I think if you look at the Harvard at the youth poll, you know, that, that does just the 18 to 29 year olds rather than like taking out these fucking sub samples. And um, like I, again, it was the same story as these other places. Like the most, the, the people that were absolutely going to vote, like basically were at the Biden's level from last time. Like it was within the margin of error. And then among people that weren't sure if they were vote or not, it was like a coin flip. Right. I mean, so the mo the casual independents, you know, not not aligned with a party type young folks are Trump appealing. But and, and but I also th and then I, and I also think you have horseshoe theory happening. And I think that there's a lot oh, of people yeah. that Trump's anti-war. Yeah. Right. And so the people that are the most yeah. mad at Biden are the most lefty. And I think that they have some like internalized some notion that Trump is America first. He's anti-war. And this is why I think a big challenge for 2024 for Biden, et cetera, is like invading TikTok with Mein Kampf videos. Right. Like these kids have to understand like where. But you well, know, these what, kids what, have what, correctly intuited really that is. Joe Biden is Ronald Reagan's third term. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's what they don't like about him. So speaking of the youths. Tim, you, uh, for your sins, went to Arizona to TP USA to see the youths, the conservative youths. And I have so many questions for you. But I want to start with RD and Tiny D Energy. Where are the, the TP USA youths who two years ago were okay with DeSantis, right? They liked him. They, they didn't love him as much as they loved Trump, but they were okay with him. Was there any like has he been unpersoned? unpersoned. Was he just not, the primary? Like was he doesn't not, even exist. The primary was not happening in Phoenix. Like it was not happening. There were fourteen. That's 000, they, had sold, they had sold fourteen thousand tickets. It was an eight thousand person arena that was never completely full. So I, you know, but then people are walking in and out. So I, let's just say ten thousand showed up. Guy told me about a third of them are young. So let's just call it about three four thousand young people, and totally unpersoned. Like not. No, I, I, there was, I, I stopped asking like because my first set of questions that I ask the kids when I go up to them are like what are the issues that um, get you excited about why are you here what are the issues when you talk about that and and where are you in the primary are you Trump or DeSantis or Vivek or Nikki I stopped asking that after day one because everybody's kind of like Trump and I and I the kid and I get kind of self-selected by kids who know not my party Right, so the kids who know not my party will come up to me, and they're they're the not the kids that like were yelling the n word at that guy in that viral video <laughs> that went around. Right, like they they are kind of like the kids that come up to me are Trump. They're the Trump squish friendly. Mangas. Yeah, they're like squi the squishiest of the magas. Right, like there's a little bit of a selection bias there, and so I saw a couple from last year. Right, because I went last year. And, um, you know, that were DeSant that were you know leaning DeSantis or, or even you know leaning somewhere else, and. And, you know, the answer I always got was, well, the campaign's over. It doesn't matter. I might as well. Like, we're just on board with Trump. We're accepting it. Like, DeSantis has been terrible. He's run a terrible campaign. So the campaign was over in Phoenix. Like, the, nobody on state, like, like there was barely even mention. The, the, v, the straw poll was about the VP. The straw poll was about who Trump should pick for VP. Who not, won? Not the primary. Uh, Tucker. No, handily, no and then And then Vivek was second. Um, I forget who finished in third. So uh, was there any any Jeff Rowe crowing? Was anybody was anybody gloating over, or is it was it as if DeSantis 
literally didn't even exist. Yeah. I mean, again, like a lot of these people I don't think hated DeSantis. It was the people from Sarah's early focus groups, right? Like they liked what, DeS- you know, DeSantis sending the migrants to Massachusetts and stuff, but they just thought the campaign was really, there was some crowing about just like how pathetic the campaign was and how bad it was. But like, like from the stage, people weren't making fun of DeSantis really. I mean, Gates, you know, who I, who I wrote about, um, you know, said kind of, I'm just, I'm ready for all the DeSantis people to come back and start being nice again, you know? And so it's like a little bit of crowing, right? But it was more like, it's so over. I'm, I'm, I'm already into Nikki, Olive though, Branch right? mode. They hate Nikki? Oh my God. So when Bannon on stage says that the the corporate establishment, Fox News, Paul Ryan, Ron Romney, McDaniel... Like, what they're doing right now with this Nikki momentum is they don't think that she can win, but they're trying to set her up to be the VP. And they're, that's what they're going to tr- try to do. And this place goes insane. Like, rabid booing all around me. And then, they're, then they began a Tucker chant, which then moved into a fuck her chant. Ooh. Um, which then there were a few. And then Those things like, rhyme. And then, and then Bannon is going, she's demonic. She's demonic. She's evil. And then, um, and then some people around me started yelling, "Lock her up!" She's going to endorse Trump when this is all over. Have you, have you guys seen the video of her being asked about being Trump's VP? No. Like, yeah. So she is dodging it. She kind of does like. I find it offensive. I'm not playing for second. Like, she's got a line about yeah. it. I don't play for second. But she does not rule it out. And DeSantis has. Uh, and I think as long as she's keeping that door open and Trump, like, if Trump's smart, what does he do? He keeps that door open. Because then she doesn't go hard at him. And also, I don't know if you guys saw, so Trump's got his first, um, the Trump campaign has their first attack ad on Nikki. And it is the softest, most milk toast, most normal. It's about Nikki flip flopping on the gas tax. It's no like pudding fingers Ron and is such a weirdo. It's just like you can't trust Nikki Haley because she flip flopped on the gas tax. Here's a clip of her saying she won't raise it. Here's a clip of her saying we're raising it. Um, and you think it's so normal politics that you go, hmm, like that is not a real attack. Um, it's like a fake. It's like a head fake attack. So anyway, I am um, the idea that he holds that out. I don't think he picks her, but I think he no holds way. it out. I think she holds her fire, and uh, that's. Yeah, I we think are. we're in a Romney situation. They go to have they go to have dinner. Yeah. People take a picture. You know. Trump knows he, how to he, play these people. Yeah, he makes her grovel, and then he can smell weakness. Yeah. No. He's, I mean, when they had the locker up chant going, it's kind of like. I just, I, I don't, you know, we talked with that David Grant on the podcast about how the big deal was McCain couldn't pick Lieberman in 08 because, of, like, they can't pick Nikki. They can't pick Nikki. Well, but but also Trump wouldn't want to. Yeah. Because he knows he, he can't want trust Pence. her. Yeah, he can't have Pence 2.0. Can't trust her. Uh, real quick, before we move on from this, Ted Cruz, he did this weird thing. He's really committed to his, his old middle-aged man mullet, and he's gotten tubby again, and... He's up there like a sort of Cletus version of Matt Foley talking about liberal men can't satisfy their women. And I just. Man. His line. So his line was actually these liberal women are so pissed off. They're just. so. But you'd be pissed off, too, if you had to have sex with those weenies like these weenie liberal guys. Hmm. The thought when whenever Ted, Ted Cruz, Cruz certainly isn't a weenie. Yeah, whenever Ted Cruz <laughs> says anything that, like, connects him talking and, like, thoughts of sex, like, the what, the lesbian gear in me goes so high, the, like, oh, I'm so glad I don't have to, like, he's so repulsive <laughs> and revolting. Um, I, I don't understand how women can look at Ted Cruz and think, I want, I enjoy that species. Yeah. Nothing says masculine like letting uh, the guy that just beat you in a campaign insult your wife's looks. Like that's, yeah. that's really an alpha male move. I'll tell you and this. Then, and then you endorse him. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you this. <laughs> the, um, th- that, this thing, though, was endemic throughout the speakers. It was not just Ted. 
Um, like one of the key themes with these guys now is this machismo, you know, like we need strong men and they're going to have a wife, like the strong men obey God and the wife obeys the man and they're going to have a family. And like, you know, Jason Whitlock was on stage talking about how uh, he wants to go back to pre-suffrage where the family just has a vote, one vote per family. Um, and there's a lot of insulting of single women, cat ladies, you know, um, there is a lot of insulting of gays, obviously just jokes, jokes about gays at like their expense, weenie boy, boys, chicks with dicks, a lot of trans jokes. Um, and so like it, it is there is there was there is something that is absolutely inseparable from the MAGA thing that is that is this machismo element to it, you know, and and when like when you're talking to them like the the kids like I, I do think that there just is some reaction that's happening i mean some of this is like tale this time patriarchy but there's also some reaction that is happening like the, where they feel like you know the the straight white man is being uh you know is being insulted and like this and and that the culture and that they're being minimized in the culture and they've got to take the culture back and they've got to demean these other people, and that that is very central to this. And like when you're when and when you talk to them, it's it's very noticeable. It's not like a one off. It was Ted Cruz's thing was not a one off. It was a very common theme. Nobody else was talking about pleasuring women. Um, you know, I don't I don't remember any other orgasm talk, but um, uh, but but the theme was constant. Tim, did so you United run into States any senator? Your... Yeah, I know. So yeah, nice. and boy, does he hate it. Yeah. Tim, did you run into any of your like twinks for MAGA? Dolores, who were your? Do you remember those? Those yeah, kids the gays against groomers. Around? I did. I yeah, did. the gays against How are they groomers. Doing? The gays against groomers has lost a little momentum. Because of DeSantis, say. probably right. Because um, that was really because DeSantis his thing. DeSantis has lost some momentum, and I think also because it's a little bit. It's starting to get a little real. The gays against groomers. like the amount of anti the anti gay talk is really ramping up. Like the gays against groomers thing was all part of like we the MAGA likes gays, right? But it's just we just don't like these teachers grooming our kids. And now there's more of you know, um like like many speakers made jokes at gay people's expenses. And so there there's still gays there. Um but I, I do I don't know. I didn't see people with the gays against groomers shirts. I will tell you when, as I said, my, the question I ask every kid is like, "What are the issues that animate you?" Immigration is one of them. Um, grooming is another one. Like for one example, a kid said, um, we "We're going." I was going down a line of these bros, and I was like, "All right, top issue." It's like immigration, immigration, school reform, immigration, and I was like, "Ooh, I want to come back to you, school reform guy." So like, school choice or what are you talking about? He's like, "No, I'm talking about the grooming." And I was mm. like, oh, right, right, got it. That's what, that's what school reform is. For the, that's what education reform is for these guys, stopping the, teach, stopping the, uh, the, penguin, the gay penguin books. Uh, and, then, and then it's anti-war. Those yeah, are the type of the immigration anti-war. and no foreign entanglements. And then the, guy, the TPUSA guy sent me the poll afterwards, and it's funny. It's like the, Israel is 50-50, the straw poll that had Tucker winning. Israel is 50-50, should we support Israel in the crowd? Uh, Ukraine was two wow. two ninety eight, and so to me, like I just I think that the Israel number is like that's moving. That's that'll that'll settle in around twenty percent. I mean, there'll be some you know uh, vestigial Jewish folks or like, and then evangelicals who kind of like think that Jesus is going to come back to Jerusalem or whatever. But I, I think but the Trump Israel has gotten to have that one both ways. I know. I mean, this is the the the, the Trump Israel Hamas thing is really interesting in that he. You know, his numbers on like, you know, do you think Trump would handle the Israel situation? Are very high. He's like over 60 percent. And and despite that, like he's dancing in the middle on that. But what and, they mean, what they mean is, so I hear this all the time. People think, you know, like we're like, well, Trump is a lunatic. And everyone's like, yeah. And he's so unpredictable. And that's why these foreign leaders like we they won't even test us. They won't have wars with each other. The reason the wars are happening is because Biden's weak and everyone knows America won't do anything. But Trump's so strong that these wars wouldn't even happen. You know, Putin wouldn't have invaded Ukraine if Trump was here. Uh, Like none of the Israel stuff would be happening. Like That's what they believe. They believe that Trump's unpredictability is his asset on foreign policy and will keep uh, keep wars from happening. I do not understand how that could possibly apply to the situation with Hamas and Israel. That's okay. 
Uh, all right, this is, we're running super long, so let's uh, very quickly, we're going to try something Wait, new. Wait, okay, hold on, I'm sorry. Go I, I no, want to go, go long. There's so much to talk about. I, I have to ask Tim, I'm on this talking, uh, the TPUSA thing. I saw the clip of you with Bannon, yeah. right? And I had, I, so one of the things that I think is going to both become a conversation, I think is happening a little bit underneath the surface right now, is how afraid there was like a new york times article recently about iowa voters saying that they didn't want to be quoted saying that they were for somebody else in the republican primary because they get scared of trump supporters right and i think that it is an underappreciated element of trumpism the menace okay but i watched you uh in the room with them and bannon was sort of like hyping you up as a as an as an as a cartoon enemy but in a way that totally seemed to also con- like convey that you were there to be jested at but not harmed, right? right. Like there wasn't – he wasn't bringing menace to it. He was bringing um, – and I think that one of the interesting things about Trump's Republican Party is how you can – Wayne, wax and wane between the humor of it all and the menace of it all, right? right. The things like kind of go back and forth. Did you feel totally safe there at – because you seemed fine. Yeah, I felt safe. I mean, there was one guy that was very unhappy um, mm-hmm. that they had me. Because after, you know, the video clip, you know, where I go up and I say, um, let's give it up for our, our legitimate president, Joe Biden, and try very to start funny. a USA chant. Um, and then I went back there, and, like, the B- Bannon's producers or whatever, like, they like me. Like, yeah. I, like they, they, they like arguing with me. It's kind of like there is a little bit about old, like, college debate school attitude. Like, they are, you know, they, they, don't, they don't have anything personal with me about being a traitor, right? Like, it's different. Like, the people that are more mad at me are, like, my old friends who I judge and who I say that they've made, mor- they've made moral compromises, right? Like, yeah. Bannon knows I find him morally repulsive, right? And that just doesn't bother him. Uh, and that doesn't bother those people for whatever reason I, it is a little bit of a different dynamic so i'm standing back there just kind of talking with and like asking you know trying to get information to get people's perspective understand what's happening in their warped brains and a guy comes up and he's like why is this guy get to hang out backstage like i'm part of the posse like i'm part of the war room posse like what's his fucking like what's his problem and like a couple of the ban bannon has security which i asked him about i was like what do you have security for and he's like the ccp like, okay. <laughs> okay, he's like, it's not the libs. I'm not scared of the libs. Okay, man, it's the CCP. Well, he I remember for. he was he was on he was that on the Chinese dis- the Chinese yacht. yeah dissidents yacht uh, when the, and they were both involved in the build the wall scam. Yeah, and maybe the Chinese dissident actually turned out wasn't a dissident and was a spy playing both sides. I don't know. There's a lot. There's a lot we could go into there. But <laughs> anyway, so Bannon had security. So a couple of those guys did like go up and calm that guy down. So I, I didn't. I mean. What was this guy going to do? Punch me in front of everybody? I mean, maybe I guess, but I, I I didn't feel particularly concerned. But he was kind of menacing. Um, but you know, I, I look. I think that the thing that worries me about all of this is it only takes one percent. You know, and yeah. I, I and I think that there's a self-selecting nature of this. If you're going to this thing, a you kind of have high sociability. Like you want to go to a conference. You know, it's mostly like college Republican guys or older people that have nothing to do. And I had a couple older people like that, that came up to me afterwards, and I was like, "My daughter's a lib like you. Like, how do I talk to her? How can we?" You know, <laughs> yeah. like it's kind of sad almost, right? Yeah, and totally. And so to me, it's like. There's another category of people that's one iteration over from this that's getting all this information on their laptop, and they're not leaving their house, and yeah. they're getting madder and madder, right? And yeah. so I, so I don't, I, I don't want to say because I didn't feel scared that I don't think that there is a menace to it. There is, I think, but um, but in the in that moment, it was not different. I will say at the Carrie Lake event in Queen Creek right before the election, we're also like not at the highest stakes moment. You know, yeah, all yeah, the domestic yeah. terror, like our friend Elizabeth Newman said, like, all these experts are like, like, it's always is there's a building and a building and a building. And that's why January 6th was like, there's this one moment, one place. Like, that's what you have to worry about. We're not at that right now. And like at that Carrie Lake rally three days before the midterms in Phoenix, I did feel a little unsettled. Like, I was mm-hmm. just kind of looking around at the crowd and I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I feel, <laughs> I don't know how good I feel about this. I got to get out of here. So anyway. Sorry, JVL. I know no, you're trying to I control. Wanna, I, wanna, I know you're trying you to control breathe. things. You you do what you want to do. Uh, <laughs> all right, can we move on? Because two hour Christmas it's an incredibly pod. long two hour show. Christmas <laughs> pod. Let's do it. <laughs> a Christmas miracle. People uh, are going to be with their in laws. They need a distraction. They need stuff to do. You know, they need a they need an escape. 
No one's going to be mad at me. Not me. I love my in-laws. Not me. I love my in-laws. But other people. ProPublica put out another Clarence Thomas piece. This one suggesting that Clarence Thomas had started hinting, not not even really hinting, that if he didn't start bringing home some more cash, he was going to have to retire. And, uh, you know, immediately after that started happening, conservative world swung into uh, action to start lending him money and making sure that he could live the lifestyle he wanted to. And it's an amazing, amazing piece. And there's there's a quote in it. I, I'm not going to be able to find it right now. But uh, I read it on the show with AB that she and I do now. And uh, there's this guy who's a law professor who is a friend of both Thomas and Harlan Crow who vocations with them who uh, who said, like, oh, yeah, no, they're not trying to, to you know, influence his decisions they're just trying to you know give him the lifestyle that he deserves and it's the most like when you are an appointment for life you can you can blackmail people by simply saying i'll leave this post if i don't make more money it's really wild and uh and nothing will come of it it's just amazing to me i don't know do you guys have thoughts about it or just like meh that was the JVL rapid fire one. You got you got to yeah. do it. I'm I've been preparing my rapid fire. All right, Tim. Butt sex in the Senate. Butt sex in the Senate. Okay, I don't know anything about. I mean, Clarence Thomas does seem to be, uh, well, I guess kind of you might say whoring himself out a little bit, so to speak. Uh, you might see a word about that. I just want to say something to. We have a handful of gay listeners I hear from from time to time. I am just supportive of everybody expressing their sexual desires in whatever way they want in 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 private or even whatever way. Even oh, private. There we go. Much better. Uh, ding, even little voyeurism is fine. I don't I don't want to hear uh, Ted Cruz talking about like sticking his little pickle in anybody. I don't like that. But if you know if you want to go do a little deal and take a little video of yourself and put it on your green circle, okay. That's, I don't know that's, what that is. That's for you. On Instagram, there are these green circles where you just put other gays in there and then you kind of send your sexy pics to your friends that, you know, that are just your close inner circle. It's an inner circle Instagram service. Hmm. Anyway, if you want to do that, all good. All right. But, you know, you can't do butt stuff in Amy Klobuchar's chair in the Senate hearing room. Okay. That's a no. It's just a no. And there were several, and then the guys coming out, he's like, they're coming after me because I'm gay, and they're coming after me because I'm an identity. And it's like, no, bruh. They're coming after you because you were doing butt stuff on Amy Klobuchar's desk. All right? And to be like, fair, not cool. to be fair, if this was a straight couple that had filmed themselves, I think people would be equally... Also un- bad. All, I don't <laughs> yes. think there... I don't think... Uh, there's a... There's a Lesbians might brings, be able to get away with it. If, no. It brings out a certain element, the fact that it was gay, but I don't think... Uh, I don't think anybody having sex and filming it on Amy Klobuchar's chair or yeah. any of the senator's chair would go without punishment and yeah. recrimination. Question, Tim, yeah. I have a question for you. I know this is your segment. As punishment, should Senator Klobuchar be allowed to throw a binder at the offenders? Seems like he would like that. The, the, um, so probably, I don't know if that would be a punishment. Okay, um, never mind. Just, uh, just based on the video, it seems like he'd like that. So, Withdrawn. Yeah, look, everybody, it was a, a, a Sebastian is messaging, it took five minutes for my gay kip, kickball group chats to identify the guys, to, the guy. I mean, it's just, you're playing a little fast and loose. That's all I'm saying. I, I, I don't like people, the green circle should be a private space. I don't like people leaking it, but, you know, I, I just, you, 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 you have to, there, there's some, I think, judgment calls here. The Senate has a cloakroom, I've heard. That might seem like a nice place to try, you know, a little sexy time. Or maybe just like a or little handy. Or none of these places. Like Go a little home. handy under the table. Go home. <laughs> yeah, home is also good. I'm just, I'm just saying, I, for me, it's like, I, wanna, I, I just want to state that, like, I have pretty liberal mores on this front, and, and, and this is way over the line. Okay, way past the line. That's There's all an ice skating rink on the Capitol Mall this time of year. That would have been fine, right? Yeah. Uh, or the right. trees in the mall at night, you know, where we used to go uh, get get high in college at GW. Like, maybe you could do a little, a little handy over there. That could be okay. But Amy Klobuchar's chair, young man, come on. What does your mother think about this? Sarah. Okay, so I'm just going to go from that to some polling information. Just want to talk about some polling. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so uh, two things. Polling? Oh, Oh, boy. I hate it. I hate it. Uh, Okay, 
So Cook Political Report has uh, has has two ratings changes mm-hmm. for Michigan and Nevada. Both went from lean D to toss ups mm. uh, after all of the polling that's been coming out. Um, so we did some good news polling earlier in the show, but this is the bad news polling is that for Michigan, which which uh, Gretchen Whitmer just won by 10 points over her Republican um, whatever rival. Uh, that's tough. Uh, it's a tough, tough thing. Also, there's a new Emerson, Iowa poll. Uh, the head to head has Trump up eight over Biden, but that's not the part that's interesting. <clears throat> the part that's interesting is that uh, Haley has moved into second place, um, still losing to Trump Ooh. by 33 points, though. Huh. So Haley's at set. Yeah, so this is Iowa. Hmm. Iowa. So this is interesting in the, again, um, going back to the point about how this Colorado news is going to step on what might have been some Haley Mentum opportunities. This is a good one where you now have your first poll in Iowa showing that Haley has now uh over DeSantis. So she's at 17. He's at 15. Trump is at 15. Five, Can six, I tell you serious. that uh, I, I, had a, I had a drink with Vivek's, a Vivek staffer. I guess I we were off the record, so I shouldn't say who it was, but a Vivek staffer. And I have to tell you, I was, I was really caught off guard by the fact that they genuinely think they are going to finish second in Iowa. Oh. Which seems delusional to me. He well, is at, he's at 8%. Christie's at 4%. Yeah, he, th- he thinks that there's going to be a surge of non-traditional caucus voters for Vivek Ramaswamy, people that aren't, aren't so sure about whether the earth is flat around or 9-11 conspiracy well, theorists. A lot of people that are Rick coming Santorum out from surged. That. Yeah. Right? Why not Vivek? Here, here's a very serious question, and I, I'm not just trying to troll because I'm the one who said maybe DeSantis doesn't make it to Iowa. If you are Ron DeSantis evaluating your political future— and I assume he wants a political future. Like he's not going to be content to ride off into the sunset and just make money. Which is worse? Staying in and finishing third and maybe even a bad third if the bottom drops out? Or just getting out right now and not making it to Iowa? Well, this is where we haven't really talked about Jeff Rowe. Um, but like... What what uh, it's a great question. They're in complete disarray. Uh, they have no so like they've built this ground game in Iowa. Like that's the main thing that the pack has done that I think that I think everybody would agree that their uh, their media strategy has been a bust. Uh, but this ground game is like the one thing that they've really invested in. So it'd be a little wild of them to walk away from that because that's the part they believe in. Um, that being said, DeSantis is moving quickly from like 2028 uh, leader to never having a political career again. Yes. And I, I'm not sure getting out now versus get, finishing third in Iowa, I'm not sure he avoids that period. Yeah, I don't think it matters one way or the other. Yeah. I do think that it's preposterous. The whole the door knocking thing was always preposterous. The whole thing is ridiculous. This is not a state senate race. Like, you're not going to, like, by knocking on somebody's door and handing them a hanger that's like, Ron DeSantis, you know, <laughs> like, cut taxes and and banned get people from mentioning gay stuff in school. So they think that's going to, like, work? It's going to help turn people out? I, like, the whole thing is, the whole thing is just absurd. I don't know, but we should, we should take some shots at Jeff Rowe. Because I, I do want to just say, like, this is obviously, m- most people don't care about the guy running the outside pack, nor should they. Um, but I would like to say for a guy whose firm was taking 60 cents on the dollar out of this uh, and who, um, you know, after sniffing around the Trump campaign, uh, went hard for DeSantis, I I think that it is imp- – like if any of these – and I'm sure nothing – I'm sure nothing will actually happen. But like anyone who was on the DeSantis campaign should never work again. Like this is the most incompetent race I have ever seen. It's uh, they the uh, and and I've seen some incompetent ones. Uh, I've seen some campaigns, Timmy, with some big money, uh, and that have and have spent it poorly. Uh, like I've seen people make some dumb decisions. This is the worst thing I have ever seen. Did you see yesterday? They put out a thing that was like Trump Haley. Like his big thing now is that Nikki's consi- Nikki's thinking about being his vice president, and I'm like, 
what argument is that? What argument are you making? Are you making an argument that Nikki is good enough to be Trump's VP? That Trump is bad because he's picking Nikki? Like, what is the argument that you think is going to resonate with people from doing that other than make saying you're not in the mix, <laughs> like you're gone? Make the establishment great again was the tagline. Yo, know, uh-huh. like the difference between this and Jeb was that in Jeb in Jeb's campaign, which which I'm not going to sit here and defend, but like the strategy was defensible because it had just worked for Mitt Romney. Yeah, right? it was just like you raise a bunch of money, you put a bunch of money on TV, you let these crazy people go up and down, you solidify your spot in the normal lane, and then eventually, when people get serious and get to vote, they're going to vote for you. Uh, obviously that seems silly in retrospect, but like at the time, like that is just how Mitt Romney had just won against, you know, all the crazy people that went up and down in that race in 2012. And so and that's how McCain had won. I know it. Um, this is like eight years after that. <laughs> this is my whole thing. It's like Ron DeSantis is running the same campaign. We all saw him fail eight years ago and doing it poorly. Anyway. Well, I mean, the good news for DeSantis is that, a DeSantis is probably viable for 2028. It just isn't him. Casey. So I think it's yeah. pretty clear that Casey will be the next one getting an actual big girl. I'm campaign. excited for the Casey versus Gates uh, Florida governor primary. That's going to be mm-hmm. good. Yeah, I think that's basically where we're at. And, and I'm not kidding. Like, I, I actually think that's Maybe the most likely Byron thing. Donald's. Yeah. She, so, is, uh, she is better than him by miles. Well, Like, if you watch them talk. Than him. I, I know, but she... Well, I mean, I do, you do see all these clips where it's just like her going on a long monologue and he just kind of sits there uh, and like, so does the governor of uh, Kim Reynolds. Uh, but but she's not bad. I mean, she's bad, but she's not. She is. She's she's much better at it, much more compelling than he is. She's closer mm-hmm. to Carrie Lake. Should okay. we talk about Christmas and make this a two part episode, JVL? Do you have anywhere to go? Oh, <laughs> Maybe we can make sure, this a two part extravaganza. That's great. This is it'll be like Kill Bill Volume One and Volume Two. Tell yeah, us no, about Christmas, Tim. No, it's okay. I was I, I was more curious about what you were going to do. You're the one that has four kids and has a lot of Christmas joy and is running a Christmas poll. Yeah, but it's okay. We don't have to Christmas we don't have to joy. talk about that. I was just wondering so, how the shopping has been going and all that. And, I love it so much. Uh, but uh, we have a we have a San Francisco event January 18th. We should talk about. That's right. We're going to be out in San Francisco, uh, Frisco, as the locals call it. And uh, isn't that right, Timothy? Just the three of Let's us. Go. San Fran. They like to call it. SF San is what Fran. they say. It's SF be great. or San Francisco. I'm very excited. Uh, I will not be able to take in a game at Pac Bell Park, sadly, because the season will not have started yet. But I'm looking forward to spending a good 18 hours on the ground in San Francisco <laughs> and seeing you guys and getting sick from it because that's going to happen. Can I be a crazy person and just wear a mask on the plane because I don't want to get sick from the, no. the animals next to me no yeah. they, they, allowed the, to do the, that what you i mean you're allowed to do what you want it's a free country but like the if you just think about it rationally the wearing the mask on the plane and then going to this event where you are going to shake hands and put your arms around and take selfies with a bunch of people like which which one is more likely for you to get where you're going to get sick uh, remember the seinfeld episode with bubble boy Maybe I can be the bubble boy. I'll be in a little plastic bubble with my arms. Can I just tell you, we've done a bunch of these. And And I get uh, sick every time. Really? I get sick from my children at home. I never get sick from these events. I I mostly, not mostly, I would say I I go about 50-50 with kid germs at home. Sometimes I Mm. I make it, sometimes. In fact, I'm making it right now. My flu A is in the house, and so far, touch wood, I'm doing okay. But I go to events with you guys. And the people, and I have to sit on a train or fly in an airplane, and then I just, you know, 36 hours later, I'm down. Okay. Stop licking your hands, man. Yeah. It's good. We have a great Sunday show. show for everybody. We have a great Sunday show. Tune back in for that. You'll be very excited. we got plenty of Christmas, Christmas Eve cheer. show. A lot it's of gonna Christmas. Be great. Good show, long show. If you live out in the Bay Area, come and, come and hang out with us on January 18th uh, at the Commonwealth Club Got to go get tickets now, though. Uh, go to our website, thebulwark.com slash events. And uh, Merry Christmas. Merry we have one more Christmas. show. You felt we have one animals. more show before the end of the year. Yeah, we're, we're back. We're yeah. not going on we're, any vacations. Yeah. We got all the content We'll come need. back with our 2024 predictions. Peace out. Things See will ya. be bad. <laughs>